Revolutionaries are different. You know, they think differently. They don't conform to norms the same way. And that's what Doug was like. You know, he, he was guided by this powerful internal compass that said, mankind needs to learn how to solve problems, really complex and increasingly complex problems, um, collaboratively. Vision is essential in business. Vision is not part of the academia only. Vision, you know, we have a vision for Logitech. I'm sure Google has a vision for Google and Apple has a vision for Apple. But we're talking about a, a different scale of vision because Doug had a vision for mankind. And we can't afford, as, as executives of companies, to have a vision for mankind that is too disconnect from the task at hand. He could. The price he paid is a little isolation and disconnection. But what he brought to the party, each of us in different parts of the technology industry have taken advantage of. I hope you'll go along with this rather unusual setting and the fact that I remain seated when I get introduced and the fact that I'm going to come to you mostly through this medium here for the rest of the show. Well, Doug was a... Um, a man with a mission. His mission was to improve the human race. He was one of the visionaries of the 50s and 60s uh, and has had an influence on the evolution of networking and computing ever since, even though a lot of people don't know that. The intent was to build tools, which we're going to talk about over and over and over again, so that I can do more. Not tools to replace what I'm doing, but tools to augment me, not to replace me. But he wanted to tackle difficult problems, and he wanted computing to make that not only possible, he wanted the changes in the machine to change the people who used them. It's amazing to me how long it's taken for Silicon Valley to catch up with Doug's vision because they love to make money off these breakthrough ideas and they, he just kept handing it to them. These holy grail ideas over and over and over again and they just kept handing them back. He had great ideas and if you, th if you listen to what he said, you could begin to see the power. But of course these ideas were forming all the time and, 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 and gelling. And so you had to watch this process. You had to really get into Doug's head and see what was going on. Its principle is that there are two wheels that roll on the surface. But since they're right angles and kind of sharp edges, one roll and the other slide in one direction. He was the rare character in Silicon Valley who was not focused on an IPO, not focused on making a fortune but was truly committed to improving the world. He realized, as did a small number of others, that somehow computing could be more than about crunching numbers. It was about um, augmenting our human capacity. He was the person who was able to bring about computing as we do it today. I don't think you can go back in time and find a more clear vision or clear understanding of what computers would come to be. So when I started at SRI, this building was there. Uh, but the engineering building, this building over here, was not yet built. That whole area was uh, these slow, very inexpensive uh, 
wood buildings that were built as an emergency hospital for World War II but never used. A major issue that we had in them was that the mice and rats used to eat through the computer cables. I learned that you get quite a buzz if you clamp onto a 60 hertz circuit <laughs> with your teeth. So, uh, and then this building was starting to be built um, at the far corner here that corner office was Doug's office. My office was right across from it. We basically had the, our group wound up growing in size as we built up to the 68 demo and afterwards. So we were most of the second floor of this wing of the building. The funny personal story about this building and me is that, that I think it was 67. We moved into the building, which was great. We didn't have NLS working as a display-oriented system, but we had bootstrapped it up enough that we could use it for line editing, and we were using it as the editor to write the programs to then bootstrap it up to get it to be the display system. And we'd set up a conference room, actually. We took a set of offices, and we had them hollowed out, so we had one large room. We had the walls lined with brown boards at the time. They weren't blackboards, they were brown. We had all the documentation for the data structures on the walls. We all sat in the middle of the room with Model 33 teletypes programming. But it was a 24-hour day job and I was getting tired and I was also trying to go to school. So one night I was just so tired, about two o'clock in the morning I decided to give up. But if I could take a teletype home with me, if I could take a Model 33 home, then I could be programming from home, which would be better than sitting here all night programming. So I took the Model 33 teletype and I carried it down and I was putting it in my car, the lobby on the other side of the building and a guard found me. And he didn't know whether to arrest me or, you know, I mean, it was really kind of funny. So we wound up calling Doug who didn't know what to do, who called the VP of engineering for SRI, who told the guard to let me go. And so I believe I had the first home computing facility ever. <laughs> with my Model 33 teletype hooked up to the SDS 940 here at SRI. Yeah, I grew up near Portland, Oregon, uh, near enough in the country so that I went to high school in, in town. I was probably a senior in high school when the war broke out for us. And uh, I got a deferment because I was entering Oregon State University uh, to study engineering. But it was during the war, I began hearing about radar, which sounded very magical. And the thing that intrigued me was, was hearing that when you went to school to learn about it, you would uh, march in and sit down in your class, and then they'd open up the vaults and give you your books, and then they would be put back in the vaults after your <laughs> class because it was so secret. Somehow that seems so intriguing and the magical thought about rad what radar must do. So, so for a while they were deferring engineering students, so I got all the way through the first two years before I got drafted. And then I went into the Navy, into their electronic technicians program, and uh, learned all about the secret thing called radar, and radar and sonar, radio. Doug uh, went into the Navy at the end of the war, and he actually, um, as he was sailing uh, to the Philippines, um, uh, as the boat was going out under the Golden Gate, uh, it was VJ Day. And so the war was over, but he was going anyway. And he spent a year as a radar operator in a, in a small island in the Philippines. And while he was there, he stumbled first across uh, a Life magazine article, and then the original article um, a popular article written by an American physicist whose name was Vannevar Bush. And uh, Bush had written an article called As We May Think. And he described a hypothetical machine that didn't exist called a Memex. And the Memex was basically the computerization of all the library information so that it could be more effectively used. And that stuck in Doug's mind and ultimately it became the heart of, of his model is this, we would sort of take all knowledge and we would make it accessible to these teams of workers. And you know, well, lo and behold, when the World Wide Web came along, we finally had that for everybody. But Doug saw that first in 1945. 
I think it was very early on, and Doug would go on to actually describe this in one of his first papers on the augmentation framework. He had this notion of this, at that point they were circular displays and they used light pens as the control tool. This was a very primitive, but it was a, a, a you know, a prescient view of, of the power of computing. And so he took those ideas, I mean, uh, Vannevar Bush was not thinking about electronics. I mean, the electronics didn't exist then, and he took them and he transposed them into this world of displays and computing. And uh, he was the first one to have that view of the world. I love the backstory to how he did this. I mean, how many people do you meet who proposes and then decides at 25 that he needs to find a life purpose beyond just going to jo a job and having a steady income and supporting a family? So he got married and he was trying to think about his career. And it just struck him um, that he could use these technologies to basically make it possible for the world to sort of innovate intellectually more quickly. And then a light bulb went off. He was an electrical engineer, and he realized that he, this was a seed of a revolution. And he committed his life work to making it happen uh, so that people could t learn to talk to each other. And that was the fundamental idea, and he stuck to it his entire life. So I was on this committee at the University of Washington to choose the next computer. Should it be an IBM computer or a control data computer? Whereas I wanted a B5000 from Burroughs because it ran Elgol. And I went to the 1965 Fall Joint Computer Conference to meet with the sales reps from all these different companies. And Doug came by. And he gave me the bootstrapping pitch. And I was just blown away. I got it, had it down. So instead of going home from the Fall Joint Computer Conference, I came to SRI, Stanford Research Institute at the time, and spent the next couple of days rushing through an interview process here and at Stanford and um, decided that this is what I wanted to do with my life. So I got accepted into the Honors Co-op program at Stanford so I could become a student, and I had a job offer from SRI, and I went home and told my wife, we're moving to Menlo Park. One of the uh, interesting contributions uh, that Doug made, and it was also an, an insight that he had very early, because remember, the integrated circuit was, was developed in the late 1950s, early 1960s. And immediately, because he'd been working on other kinds of, of electronics, and immediately he saw that when the silicon integrated circuit emerged, that it would scale. And he saw that it would scale. That means, you know, both in power going up and cost going down. He understood that instantly. And the reason he understood that is he had worked in the wind tunnel um, a decade earlier as a young electronics tech. Um, he'd worked at NASA uh, Ames, and at that point, the aerospace engineers, they would start with a small model and they would scale up. So when he saw, when he realized that this technology would scale down, he instantly understood that there would be enough computing power in the future at a cost that he could begin to think about the kind of systems he wanted. Well, Doug studied scaling in graduate school at Berkeley. And the idea of scaling is when things increase orders of magnitude, what happens? Does everything just get bigger in some uniform way or does it fundamentally change? And Doug, oh, he studied hummingbirds and he studied insects. So think about an insect that scoots around on water. That insect sees the world very differently than we do because surface tension of the water allows the bug to stay on top and not sink. So bugs aren't worried about whether or not they float, they're worried about the surface tension. And then as they get bigger and bigger, they become heavier and heavier, they break through the water, and now they're living in a different world. And what he realized was that as the transistors would get smaller, the computations that we would be able to do would grow and grow and grow, and that this was a nonlinear progression that we could possibly be on. And so usually when something scales a factor of 10 to a factor of 100, there are major discontinuities that take place. That all of a sudden, you know, you get 20% better and 20% more efficient and 20% more efficient. And then all of a sudden, you're a thousand times more efficient and you're living in a completely different world. So you can 
do things computationally that you were not able to do previously and do them in very substantially different ways. And so that's a fundamental part of Doug's thinking is this realization that not only would things scale, but that we would go through the discontinuities. So he wrote this paper, and it did precede uh, Gordon Moore by about five or six years um, in this general idea of scaling. Although Doug wasn't the only one. The idea of scaling was around, but he was one of the first people to put it down on paper. And then, of course, Gordon formalized it. It became Moore's Law after Carver Mead called it Moore's Law into this sort of model for computing that drove the computer industry until today. Gordon Moore was a member of SRI's board at one point, and I was at a position here adequate to be at this table. And he mentioned at that particular time that Doug's papers had, had brought to him in some clarity the notion of how microcircuits might grow in smallness. <laughs> Gordon Moore actually watched Doug in that 19, I think it was 60 or 61 conference, give this talk about scaling. So the idea was floating around in the semiconductor community at that point, that there would be more computing power, that it would not go up. And the important thing about the idea about scaling is that things don't go up incrementally. Things get faster, faster, and they get cheaper, faster. And I actually think getting cheaper, faster was the big deal, because um, that meant that these computing devices could be affordable by everybody. The idea that's going to come up over and over about what are computers about? Are they about computing, doing numerical analysis and simulation, or are they about communications? And part of Doug's view this was that they were communication, but they were also to augment me, not to replace me. And so Doug called his group the Augmentation Research Center as opposed to the artificial intelligence lab. So the idea here was tools to improve my ability. And so that's where the idea of Augmentation Research Center came from. So he felt very strongly that people could work together in a collaborative way and that computers could assist that collaboration of augmenting human intellect through collaboration and computer assistance. So you often wonder about visionaries and why everyone doesn't share their vision. And Doug was among those whose vision was recognized by some, but not by others. You know, I don't think initially I understood how significant it was. And it was only probably uh, a half a decade later that, you know, I really began to understand where he fit in and how important his work was. The technical community was more resonant with the concrete realization of some of his ideas, time-sharing systems and uh, collaborative work, uh, information production, knowledge work, things like that. Um, but they were focused on the, the uh, mechanics of achieving this objective, the functionality. And I think Doug was seeing a much broader notion where uh, this sort of, sort of the vast quantity of human beings would be enabled to do things that they couldn't do by themselves or even in small groups without the help of computers. Bootstrapping is this idea, we will build these tools and then we will use the tools to build better tools. And um, it, it was a scaling process. The tools will become powerful and then they will create tools that are even more powerful. It was this idea that, that if groups improve their tools they can improve what they do, and then as they improve their process, overall processes, they improve their tools and they get it going. This was all oriented toward highly structured programming languages. And, and so we used the documentation system to improve the programming languages to make better, more compact, faster running documentation systems, and we got ourselves in the bootstrapping cycle wanted the changes in the machine to change the people who used them so that they would come along together, that, that we get sort of a double benefit. I'm going to describe what, what I think is, is, in a way, his biggest contribution to the world, which was a, a fundamental insight. Tools actually change the way we think. And in fact, just today, I was reading Google News, where they, they discovered over 300,000 years ago now, much earlier than anyone expected, home, you know, Homo sapiens actually uh, created much more sophisticated tools than anyone thought. But those tools were 
a knife or a fork or a spear or, or maybe a way to apply paint. What he understood was those early tools changed the way we think and they changed our brains. And as a result of that, they extended human capability. And I think that's where he really took that fundamental insight and applied it directly into the, the world we live in. So the tools of the mouse and the keyboard and the, the headset and the webcam and hot links, they're tools that extended our minds, but changed the way we think. The forerunner of the personal computer, all the components, you know, our graphical user interface, the mouse, which many people kind of shorthand him as the father of the mouse. The mouse is just like a side, a sidebar for Doug. It's like a little cabinet he threw off if he was a woodmaker. And Doug, you know, maybe this is the easiest way to explain what I saw. He had this invention that debuted with the mouse in 1968. It was called a key key chord, I think it was called. And it was like, a, I think, five piano keys in your left hand, and you're using the mouse in your right hand. And he's showing me this thing so proudly, and here it is, 1999, and the thing hasn't changed. And I'm looking at this going, I don't quite understand how this works, Doug. And he keeps trying to explain it to me. And apparently, I'm supposed to use the mouse over here, and then I'm supposed to be typing instructions over here. But Doug couldn't explain it to me in a way I understood. That's why he was the ultimate non-product person. He was a vision person, a technology person, but the moment something had to be shrink-wrapped into a deliverable, that was, he was not interested in that. And I think that's the reason why he sort of drifted away from the mainstream while his, his vision pervaded all of technology since you know, the 60s. me play the piano he would sit right here next to me and he would I could just see his mind going imagine an 88 key chord set so when we talked about technology being like music and he thought what if we were able to hear it and feel it and use music notation and have people actually use technology together in a whole new different kind of way. So the corded key set was unconscious and automatic for him. Just like me playing this is unconscious and automatic for me. And I can play with other people, but I can, the, the whole idea that you could actually have instead of a piano, a piano that connects to technology where we can improv together People can be on different instruments, and we could imagine futures and uses for technology. And the project was to evaluate pointing devices, evaluate and or invent pointing devices that could be used in the space capsule. Because uh, we were just starting to send astronauts up and stuff, and NASA had a big enough vision that they could see that they were gonna wanna have have astronauts interacting with computers. Uh, Doug, from his previous scaling studies, knew that our knee movement is actually the, one of the most accurate that we have in our body. And they had trackballs were invented at the time, and the trackball was basically two orthogonal, orthogonal wheels with a ball on top, and as you rotated the ball, you'd rotate the wheels, and had little digital optical things inside and so you could count wheel rotations in the software and you could figure out where the mouse was. So Doug and Bill English came up with the idea of turning the trackball upside down and, and using your wrist and your hand to move the trackball on the table rather than having the trackball with the ball facing up. So if you look at a mouse over here, on this one in the back, you can see that it's a ball up inside the gadget and it's basically, this is a malformed little track ball is what it really is. So you turn it upside down, change the dimensions, and you get the original mouse. And that's where the idea for the original mouse came from. And as the mouse moves over a surface, then each of those wheels either slides sideways without rolling or rolls an amount that very closely duplicates the particular component of horizontal or vertical and the net motion it makes. With the handset and the mouse, you could totally operate what you were doing. You could look at the screen and, and not look at your fingers and move the cursor and type. 
where if you have a keyboard, you're doing this kind of stuff. And this kind of stuff just slows you down and makes it difficult. And that was part of Doug's vision about, about if you're gonna build a system that you use a lot, really a lot, hours a day, build something that's efficient and easy for you to build, don't worry about the training. And so you want it to be an Allen case where it's more like a violin than a electric organ. The picture that I kind of think about about this, you gotta make it easy to learn. See, how much is it worth if you're going to get around a lot in the world and it's something going to be just a thing you live with and that's your mobility thing. So what is a few hours of learning how to ride something as unnatural as that as contrasted to I can immediately pick it up and work with it thing. All right. So if you came into an interview with him and he liked you, at some point during the interview, he'd pull a brick out of his desk and give it to you. And attached to the brick would be a pen or pencil and he'd say, write your name. And you try to write your name, you know, and it'd be very difficult because, you know, the pen, or the brick attached to a pen. And he'd say, now imagine what our vocabularies would be like. Imagine what our language skills would be like if it were that hard to write. I worked in downtown New York. And at lunchtime, we'd go out and we'd have lunch and we'd see all the activity. And there'd be people selling things. And there'd be a guy selling a glass cutter. And he'd make these wonderful cuts on the glass and he says, by this glass cutter, you can do it too. And of course, what's hidden there is his talent. You don't buy that, you buy this tool. I say, that's like selling a pencil and say, this pencil can write Chinese. And I think the analogy is correct here. You give somebody a computer, it's the capability of the user to find ways to use that tool to generate wonders, creativity, put things together. The machine won't do it by itself. So when I joined, there was, Doug had implemented what was called the offline system. And the offline system was the idea that you had a document and it had the outline structure. And to edit your document, what you would do is you would sit at a Model 33 teletype and you would punch a new paper tape, which were commands to an editor to edit your existing document. And you would punch it in paper tape and then the computer would read the original paper tape and your new paper tape, and it would produce a new paper tape that had your document on it. And so I really took on the task of turning that from this paper tape system into the online display system and really brought the whole software infrastructure architecture of putting together the NLS system. But the big ideas there were the sharing question of what does it actually mean to communicate. One of the things that I got a lot out of from that group was that they, like many of the other opera groups, but maybe more than any of them, uh, were bound and determined to use their system for everything that they did. And that influenced Park. Park was maybe even more so we had a, maybe a bigger critical mass, and we had some of the great NLSers there. So we went all out for building not just the display systems ourselves, but we built all of the computers ourselves, and we built all of the software ourselves. And part of the reason we were able to do it is because we'd seen the Engelbart people do some of this. Okay, the mother of all demos, 1968. One of the pivotal moments in technology, in my opinion. I saw, I watched this memos much after that, and I saw it at a different point in time. So I must have seen it maybe five times and in a period of 10 years. And so you go from uh, magic. My first, my first uh, impression was this is magic, how does this work? Because at the time I saw the demo, certain technologies that were kind of generated in a way by this demo, were not even deployed as much. Doug demonstrated uh, what was called the online system, NLS. 
And this is now, um, uh, has come to be known as the mother of all demos. And it resulted in a standing in, uh, ovation for this thing, which you would rarely see in technical communities. But he sat up on stage, um, he had a headset, uh, which he was talking from San Francisco to people in Menlo Park who were online, so he was showing teleconferencing, he was showing word processing, interactive text interaction, he was showing hypertext, although people really didn't understand that this would be the web. Okay, the first jump took me to this statement saying, all right, Augmented Human Intellect Research Center is what HIRC stands for. A hidden link will take me to the next one. So he showed them this vision that was a, a stepstone toward the world of personal computing and the internet for the first time. This guy somehow envisioned that you'd need a way to manipulate something on a screen from a distance, standing, you know, sitting, you know, uh, uh, you know, a meter or three feet away from the screen, and the the concept of having of building this originally wooden uh, device that could manipulate that was so amazing. That alone was just amazing to me. In the context of the 2000s. Uh, looking back from the World Wide Web, which you know, uh, really dominates the uh, internet uh, application space today. But looking back on uh, the period when NLS was functional, think about what he did. I mean, he had hyperlinking, uh, he had the black on white displays, he had the notion of very uh, elaborate text manipulations, which today are not part of the, uh, of the editing space. Let's make more statements. I'll say, copy that statement. And lo and behold, I have another one. Copy that one. Another one. I can even copy groups of statements. I can say, after that one, copy the group from there to there. And it does. I can look at that and say, hmm, it probably goes off the screen. It'd be interesting if I could ask the computer to collapse that, perhaps to show me just the first line of each of those statements. All right, please do that. So it did. Uh, even looking at web page manipulations and everything, they're, they are far less uh, organized than what Doug was able to accomplish in the NLS system. Uh, I, th I think that there were um, a lot of people who felt that the World Wide Web sort of only partly realized the vision that, uh, that Doug had. When Doug Engelbar sat on stage, at the Joint Fall Computer Conference at Brooks Hall. It was the first time that there's what would become the standard model in modern computing. That is, you work on a magic technology and you show it to the world. He did it first. I mean, he was talking about hypertext. He was talking about man-computer symbiosis. Clearly, Doug was one of the key contributors to that concept because it fit his thinking. The ability to move text around in a variety of ways, to, co to coordinate it, to say how it's linked to other bits of text and make that tree and that network is, is, is the key concept. You know, it's like the internet. The internet didn't just happen. That idea, that vision was there way earlier than, than most people realize. I'd like to make the following quote. Someone said, it will be possible for a businessman in New York to communicate with his colleague in London using a device no larger than a watch, instantaneously sending any picture, text, diagram, at almost no cost, no matter where the other place. Now, obviously, that person was talking about the internet. Who said that? Nikola Tesla. So he was so far ahead of all that that I was kind of floored when I watched that demo, thinking how in the world did he or he and his group get to that point before they really had anything that would have naturally, in my opinion, stimulated it. Doug saw NLS had a database of links as well as a database of data. So this allowed us to make connections in a way that are much better suited to the way people think. Today, most technology is forcing people to think the way machines are programmed with this data-driven model. But we are much more agile than that. We can go from one idea to another and repurpose and put you in a different scene. We think in links. Doug's concept of databases of links as part of how we normally work has never been actually implemented. When it came time for the thing, I was quite sick. I had a high temperature and was shaking. And my girlfriend 
laid down the law, but you know, I said, I've got to go see this thing. The theater of it was just out of sight. That's why it should be called the mother of all demos, because it was the essence of what you really want to do with a demo, which is just completely bowl people over with something that is not in any simple way an increment on what they know about. There was a lot of resistance in the world to using computers for document construction, editing, and stuff like that. People just didn't believe it could happen. They didn't understand why it would be useful. It's, it's amazing, the, if you will, sort of Luddite character of the funding community. And so Bob Taylor really had the idea of, let's do the grand, let's do a grand demo and get this out so the world will begin to believe it. He showed how computing was used in everyday life. He had a shopping list. He said, oh, let's put together a shopping list. It was about how technology could be used in ordinary life. We don't do demos like this. We do demos about, oh, how do we do these different layers and security? And, and like normal people can't understand, Doug's demo is completely intelligible to normal people. There were lots of risks. I mean, there was a communications technology uh, a challenge. They had to put microwave, um, uh, tow mobile microwave towers to communicate between Menlo Park and, and, uh, and uh, San Francisco. Um, there was this projection risk. They, this was technology that barely existed. You'd call it a prototype. And, and that's where Bill English, who worked with Doug, came in because he was a really good engineer. And he built these things and they worked. And I've tried to get the ACM to make a Bill English Award. So Bill was a very good engineer. Engelbart wanted to do, of course, three times as much as they showed. But in order to do it, it had to work. And the, the making it work part was up to Jeff. There were a lot of bugs. I mean, we'd gotten bugs out, but there were a lot of bugs. and. Uh, I wanted to make sure that we would get through the demo, and Doug wanted um, some very complicated features added to the system right at the last minute. And I froze the code three months before the demo, I think in September of 68, and um, locked the source files and wouldn't let anybody change anything. And Doug got extremely mad with him. We had some very tense discussions in his office and I stuck to my guns and wouldn't allow any code changes except unless I did them and I knew what was happening. And we got through the demo. At the time, uh, Doug's demonstration of the online system really uh, shook everybody up because I don't think they'd ever seen uh, a, such a dramatic presentation of what computers can do other than number crunching. You have to imagine for a moment that Doug is sitting in front of his screen, and it's portrait mode display. So the document structures were very hierarchical. You could manipulate vast chunks of text in the online system documents, moving things around. You had notions like plexes and, and things of that sort. It's a high level language, and that it has great structure and good control constructs like if statements and well statements, but it's also very, very close to machine language, 940 machine language. As a reporter researching the story on Doug, there was a lot of buildup. People told me again and again about this demo. And then the day came when I actually watched it. I was just dumbfounded. I was really dumbfounded because then it was 1999 and I was working on a desktop and it certainly didn't have the capabilities that Doug's demo from 1968 had. My impression on the demo varied over time as more and more of these technologies were becoming real. And so the value of the demo is probably bigger today because it goes from a marvel and mystery and a wow to, huh, he consciously or unconsciously was thinking of products that pervade our life today. The demo to me, First of all, it was the most courageous thing you can imagine. But the thing that sticks above all else is that, yes, this is a new world I'm going to show you. Standing room only. Um, people like Alan Kay said it changed their lives. You have Doug as kind of an Old Testament 
Moses opening the Red Sea kind of person. He even looked that way. You know, he was craggy. He was uh, striking. He was intense. The most illustrative thing was the final part when they were doing collaboration, talking to each other, seeing each other. Set it up so I see it over like that. That leaves a corner up there, and I say, now, computer, do the automatic switching that will bring in a camera picture from the camera mounted on his console, such as the camera mounted on mine is. Hi, Bill. That's great. Now we're connected audio. You can see my work. You can point at it. And I can see your face, and we can talk. So let's do some collaborating. That was really a part of showing what the potential of this coming computer document construction, retrieval, linking, video conferencing stuff was all about. I'd like now to have us bring in Jeff Rulison from Mendel Park, and we'll switch to his console. He's sitting on just like this, been working independently. Hi, Jeff. <laughs> We're not hearing you very well. Oh, you're not hearing me? How about now? That's fine. OK. All right. I'm sorry you can't see everybody here. Well, I can't very well either because of the lights. So we're about even. Okay. Before December 1968, computers were for computing. If you went to a computer science department, it wasn't even a part of engineering yet. Thinking of it as the way that you document and write and communicate and share with people was not part of the thinking. By January of 1969, it was part of the thinking. The whole foundation behind Apple and Microsoft and everything really went back to this demo. Technically, it was, it was an engineering tour de force never to be repeated. Norman Seif, who's a very famous uh, photographer in L.A., uh, he took a picture of uh, Steve Jobs and a, and a picture of Andy Warhol, among the many. And then he hired a painter to come in and paint over Steve Jobs' art and over Andy Warhol business. But I always thought we left one out. And the one we left out is we need a great picture of Doug, and we need to paint across that architect because he was, you know, he really was the architect of this computing world we live in. Clearly, he didn't create the computer, but he created the way that all of us interact with it. But so the network developed. We were the first node. Now, Doug Engelbart's facility up at Stanford Research Institute was the second node in the network. We came in in September of 1969. They came in in October. And the reason that SRI was a second node, was a node at all, but was because Doug Engelbart had his research group up there, and they were doing a variety of things besides the augmentation laboratory. They were doing a lot of database work. So they were the second node, and the third and the fourth came along. The ARPANET, um, like I said, he, he was one who, I think better than the others in the ARPA community at that time, could foresee the value of it. You know, the ARPANET was first created as a resource sharing system. You know, computers were a million bucks or whatever, so Utah had graphics and somebody else had something. And so we go across net to use those expensive computers. And so Doug saw that, I think, better than the others because he's the one who says, yeah, I want the network information center here. What was significant about that first connection is it was remote login. And so basically the idea was that um, the online system was going to be the first shared resource for this new network. And so that people would be able to use it all over the country. And so there was a UCLA researcher, young kid, and Bill Duvall up in uh, Menlo Park wrote the code. And then late one night, they tried the first interconnection. And it, so it wasn't email. It was, it was typing L-O-G. And what was significant uh, is that uh, the first crash happened at G uh, because of a buffer overflow error, which is really significant because, of course, that is the security problem that's plagued the computer industry for the entire era. 
And it was right there at the beginning. We still haven't fixed that problem entirely. But um, it was really Watson come here, quick moment of, of computer networking. But we were lucky. Uh, I was at UCLA during the ARPANET period and then of course the subsequent internet uh, period. So we used the online system remotely to write the documents, but they were printed and distributed to the working group in physical form. So the Network Information Center, which is what uh, Doug Engelbart's group supported, uh, was our place to uh, generate these documents for uh, collaborative purposes and for historical purposes. And that turned out to be uh, a really um, brilliant choice because they were organized around the idea of, of maintaining uh, document sequences. So we made heavy use of that system. And in a sense, we're talking about the 1970s now, early 70s, we're living in an environment, even though the capacity of the computers and the data rates were modest, we were living in, an, in a world which the rest of the world wouldn't see for 20 years. And the fact that we could do that and people could get that vision, I think really built a huge support bed for the ARPANET funding. Because now there really was a reason to tie these machines together and people could get it. So of course the ARPANET first packets weren't set until late 69. And uh, continued funding and growth of the ARPANET came out of that. The uh, idea of personal computing that Alan Kay championed so much, and Bob Taylor was completely behind, um, which Xerox Park took hold of, saw as initially part of the program, wasn't just building the original Alto, but it, it had to have the ethernet. We had to have networking or there was no point to personal computing. And so that whole dynamic started of the original ethernet and, and whatnot. It was the 1980s. And Jobs is showing off his invention, his PC, his Macintosh, that's embedded all of these, you know, mammoth breakthroughs. Jobs has got the forerunner of a lot of this in his Macintosh. And they meet, and he's showing it off proudly. Well, Engelbart takes a look at this, at this desktop, and he turns to Jobs and he says, but you missed the most important thing, networking, and Jobs responds, but everything you need is here on the desktop. And Engelbart says, this is like an exotic office with no door or telephone. And at this point, Engelbart starts telling me about Galileo, how, you know, Galileo was excommunicated. And he says, you know, but in the end, he was proven right. I know I'm right. In many ways, the, um, the demo was the high watermark for the project. Um, he got more money after that, so the project grew. Um, Doug turned out not to be a great manager, and so as it grew, um, and as he tried to um, persuade his researchers to focus on this broader vision, he wasn't able to sort of control his group well, and there was, um, there were lots of things going on, uh, both culturally and politically in the Bay Area at that time. There was an anti-war movement, made things very chaotic. There was a counterculture, and Doug was experimenting with all these things. I mean, his work, his laboratory was not just about the technology. He was trying to build what he thought of as these small groups of computer augmented um, intellectual workers and trying to make it so that they could be more efficient, more effective. He, they wanted to be able to use technology to bootstrap the group. So he was interested as much in sociology as he was in technology. Communities were key to how people could benefit from technology. And for humanity to benefit, we need to gather in community so that we balance each other out, so that no one person gets to get all the benefit. but humanity benefits. People talk about how his team left SRI and went to Xerox Park. That's because the promise of personal computing was so mind-blowing. And they said, Doug, you're a crazy old man thinking about communities and social and networks, and we don't get it. But we get personal computing and desktop computing. We have other things to do. Let's ship this product. Let's make a mouse. Let's make a collaboration software. Let's make video conferencing. And so in a way, Doug's, Doug's moved outside the mainstream of, of that thinking without moving outside the mainstream of the vision. 
And it wasn't until 1970 that Park Xerox Park started, and uh, you know Bob Taylor came along and pulled a bunch of researchers away from him. So things had already become very chaotic before that. I think there are a number of things at play here that you need to put it together. So it, sometime in the 72 or 73 time period, Congress passed what was called the Mansfield Amendment. And the idea there was that you had to show extreme relevance for your research. That meant that everybody's research took an extreme right turn at the time. And you sort of went from this extreme visionary stuff to very applied stuff. ARPA couldn't really keep the funding going the way they had kept it going because Doug was too far out on the visionary horizon and, and really didn't have much time or patience for this making it a application for the military kind of thinking. He, I think he was personally convinced that spending all this time on productizing it and trying to make it into something that could be sold for profit was detracting from working on the vision. At the time, I, I felt that Doug's fuse had probably burned a little low. I thought that it's not that he didn't have a great deal to offer, but he'd been pigeonholed as a kind of has-been, which was ironic because he was still light years ahead of everybody else. They picked what was easy to commercialize. They didn't really care which of the tool set he'd invented was gonna make it easier for humanity to communicate. So just as Jobs skipped networking because he was convinced that his desktop had everything it needed, um, generally in the Valley, those who are commercializing his products were skipping over these things that were harder to turn into user-friendly products. So he said, people were not getting the best. They were getting an inferior product that made it harder to be productive. One of his goals was something he called network accelerators. And the notion was, can the network environment make things go faster than it would otherwise? Do you know what change.org is? That's the network accelerator. Crowdfunding is a network accelerator. These things are popping up all around us, you know, and change.org is a really powerful notion, uh, nonprofit, but how can I bring this justified thing into existence, the thing that I think is justified, even though it's very social. So that was another example of, of his foresight and his somewhat blindness, you know, to, to the things which were emerging around him. The demo was certainly an enormously important performance for Doug as well as for technology. Uh, but it captured one point in time and certainly didn't capture the breadth and the depth of, of Doug's vision for the long term. Doug was one of these unusual people in Silicon Valley because now it's, it's fashionable for everybody in Silicon Valley to be a visionary. And what you realize is, and I've realized as a reporter, is most of the visionaries are wrong. They just want to be visionaries. But Doug, you know, in the 1950s, came up with the singular vision and he stuck to it throughout his entire life. I mean, in a way, it was a tragedy, right? Because he, he never felt that people could grasp his vision. But it's that singular vision and that doggedness to stay on one idea that makes a difference. And he happened to have the right idea and it changed the world. It's because he was so uh, attached to his vision of, of, you know, purity and scope, uh, he couldn't accept a sort of a partial step in the right direction that was supportable and implementable in the near term and might actually have a business model behind it. Doug, you, you created user-friendly, you invented user-friendly, but the term just eluded him. It, it, wasn't the f it wasn't what his goal was. As I said before, Doug had his vision and was channeled in it, I would say. I think a lot of the people that were with him were seeing the world was changing around him. And therefore, maybe as a consequence, Doug wasn't going fast enough. He had inspired these people, but I think my opinion was he was just a little bit wedged in his own time. It was going to be NLS or nothing. It was going to be... Uh, the mouse and the key set or nothing. It was, this This was his world, and he's going to take it in there. I think 1977 or 78, when he he left SRI with some embitterment. And one of our funders connected with, with 
with Doug. And we were so grateful that he had created this product that was now making the, the life of Logitech, making the revenue and the profit of Logitech that we couldn't not um, invite him to have his institutes small <laughs> into, into the offices of Logitech. When Doug Engelbart came here, I think it stimulated the whole company to think, uh, wow, we're really part of history here. And it was an honor, you know, for the company to, ha to have Doug Engelbart enter our four walls because he was the creator of the, the thing that, that essentially later the founders came and then created the company with. So it was a, almost like a, a discovery of, of the source code for the, the first, you know, the first program, you know, it was like this, that he was the source code. Well, Doug's story is in some ways a painful one to, uh, to think about. Uh, it's clear that he had this extraordinary recognition of what computers could do and how they could be uh, facilitating. Uh, at the same time, though, in order to cause something to actually happen on a broad scale, there has to be an underlying economic engine that makes it possible. In a world that cares about shipping products, uh, visions that push you forward as opposed to <laughs> keep you on the, on the task at hand uh, are not, you know, so easy to connect with. People focus on that contribution of Doug's, that mother of all demos. That's not what he should be known for. It was the deep intellect, the vision, looking into the future that he provided. I suspect he felt, and I feel, that demo of the mouse was just, he needed a thing, so he, he did it. That's, that wasn't his great contribution, and yet, to call it the mother of all demos, and it was, but it's not what we should be remembering Doug for. Honestly, I would say he'd still look down and say, you still haven't got it. He would still say, the world is still divided. He'd look at anything, the political climate or whatever, say, why can't people get together and work diligently, co collaboratively, on whatever the large problems of the world are. I've given you all these tools, what, you're not using them. There's so much more that could be done. You know, there's plenty of room in this space for more creative invention. And in Doug's vision, there is plenty of room you know, for us to try to catch up. The first thing that Doug Engelbart uh, represents for me is that there are people who really can see 20 or 30 years ahead. And there are very few such people. And sometimes the vision seems so unreasonable and outlandish that you just reject it as, you know, it's not vision, it's hallucination. And I suspect in some respects that's how Doug was received by people who couldn't really accept what he was fixated on and the possibilities that he felt were inherent in this technology. Well. Can we realize Doug's vision moving forward, given where things are now? And I believe the answer is yes. I believe, in fact, humanity, the users, the youth of today, use the internet as a crutch in many ways, but as a medium for interacting and for communicating, collaborating. And I think that will be able to migrate into a, a region where they see the value of what they can contribute collectively, the wisdom of the crowd kind of thing. Well, that's moving in the direction that, that Doug was talking about, to be able to use the capability of a system, collaborate among ourselves, and think big. At the end of his life, he thought we had not made enough progress in collaboration. There was all this technology, and we had these individual personal computers, but the collaborative tools like Wikipedia had not yet really begun to emerge and change the world. So my thinking is all of that could have been accelerated well before the late 1900s, 1992, 93, 94, back into maybe the 70s and 80s. And there were some people who were thinking about that, but they just didn't get it out, Doug being one of them. We have an enormous ways to go. And, and I gave a lot of talks with Doug's in the 90s, and I know he would agree with this. We have barely pierced the surface. Doug saw a world in which, in which our media and our documentation and our graphics were merged in a way of interacting with people and augmenting their ability. And, you know, now you're beginning to see a little bit of virtual reality, but it's pretty crude. Looks like the film animation films from the 80s. 
it's really not there. And, and so what we're on is an evolutionary path. And Doug always saw this as an evolutionary path. And we're just, you know, we're, we're in the first, we're 49 years now from the demo. So we're barely into the first century of the evolution. We've got quite a few centuries to go before we figure this out. There was a lot of time went by before Doug got anywhere near the recognition that he should have gotten, I think, early on. He was ahead of his time. That explains part of it. He was a wonderful man and wouldn't say negative things about anyone. And I don't want to say anything negative about him, but it was just, he was just captured, I think, by his vision. Why can't people see what I see? Without being formal, I'd like to really say that I am backed up by a really very tremendous team of these 17 guys who have caught the spirit of putting on this show tremendously and have just done an overwhelming job about putting it all together. And, and by backing me all these years in this wild dream of doing this sort of thing, and they're all catching fire, and I, I want to just tell them all right now, I owe them a lot. And a very final credit goes to my wife and daughters who are out here, to whom I'd like to dedicate this whole presentation because of what they put up with over these years, with a husband that dedicated in a monomaniacal way to something very wild. And uh, so this whole presentation is dedicated to you four people there. And I thank all the rest of you very much for coming to the dedication ceremonies.